I'm very enthusiastic to talk to you about access. Why? Because this is a procedural step. If we get it right, all the ensuing steps that comprise start to finish endodontics fall into place. We should emphasize that the axial walls are flared, flattened, and finished. The size of the access cavity should not be so controversial. It's actually dictated by where the orifices are on the pulpal floor. I think we all agree that lighting would be useful, so whether we're using glasses of some magnification or even all the way out to a microscope, I want to get everybody enrolled in good vision. The old expression is, if you can see it, you can probably do it. Well, there's a few tools that are useful to help us get into teeth. And if you look at the burr kit, I'd like to bring your attention to the lower left where you see two short burrs and we have a number two and four round burr diamond. This is useful for helping us get through tooth colored restoratives. The transmetal burr removes amalgam, precious and non-precious metals. And then finally you see the burrs get longer and we have a surgical length two and four. The surgical length burrs are critical at kicking the head of the handpiece further away from the occlusal table. This gives us a preferable line of sight down the shaft of the burr so we can watch the burr actually cut and work. We should use a brushing stroke to keep down the chatter, keep down the heat, and give us more dexterity. If you continue across from left to right, you'll see that there's the Indo Z burr. It's a very popular burr in dental schools because students can place the burr directly on the pulpal floor. It's non-cutting, so they can just work on truing up those axial walls. I like the surgical length diamond. This is the only burr in the business that gives us 13 millimeters of grit, and we can completely cut the axial wall from floor to the coronal table surface of the tooth. Let's look at the last instrument. Many of you think it looks like a Gates Glidden. Well, it's kind of like a Gates Glidden, but actually it's an economy of burrs because one burr has four GGs on its active portion. And we can use this burr with emphasis on 500 RPMs and using a brushing motion. Many of you have inadvertently placed burrs in a Midwest handpiece, stomped on the rheostat, and you might not be aware, but you're spinning at very, very high RPMs. This tends to suck the burr down into the tooth and we can get Coke bottle preps and in other instances we can strip perf. So this is a great burr for the following procedures. Notice that we can use it to flare and put a mouth on the orifice to receive all subsequent instrumentation. Finally, I want to bring your attention to the triangles of dentin. All teeth have them. But if you imagine a tin file sliding into the mesial root and entering one of those systems, you can pronosticate where the handle would be. It would be off axes as we look at the long axis of the tooth. So the triangles of dentin then put us on axes when they're eliminated and it allows us to then have more control in the apical one-third curvatures. If you look at the cross section on the right, you'll notice that the canals are never centered in the root in its mesial to distal dimensions. It must be appreciated that the orifices are off-centered and they're closer to the furcal side concavity. So a brushing motion, as an example with an X gates, can relocate those orifices away from furcal danger and will maximize remaining dentin. This is a very, very important concept, so we are conservative with the dentin and we leave all that we can for the restoring dentist. Well, to watch this burr in motion, you can begin to see we are brushing, and by using that brushing stroke, you'll break a few of the shafts. If you're not breaking an X gates from time to time, you're drilling and you're not brushing. Well, there's other ways to open up the orifice, relocate the orifices, and to flare the orifices, and get rid of those triangles. And I'm gonna bring your attention now to an instrument from the ProTaper family called the Auxiliary Shaper, or SX. Again, this can be used like a brush, and you can begin to selectively and progressively remove those triangles of dentin, so that when you place a hand file, instead of it being off axis, you can upright those handles and have them on axis. Then, a lot of good things can happen more ridiculously. A lot of people around the world want to learn how to find MB2s, mid-mesials. Uh, there's a lot of uh, aberrant canals or canals that are difficult sometimes for clinicians to find, but there's some ideas, and when we spend our time together, we're going to learn how to find them, negotiate them, 
shape them, fit cones, and pack them. And then endodontics is complete. And when we have complete endodontics, our confidence begins to grow. So listen, a lot of you need to get enrolled in piezoelectric ultrasonic energy. Notice that when we use the handpiece, there's no bulky head. So it gives us unsurpassed vision right down the instrument so we can watch the instrument in a brushing motion do a little job. Use your burrs from the access kit to remove big bulks of tooth structure, but we use ultrasonics to do precise little procedures in a very progressive way. There's a variety of different tips and configurations that all have a purpose and can help us get control of the pulp chamber so we can now focus on what lies just ahead. So if we take an ultrasonic handpiece into this tooth as an example, I want to bring your attention to a massive pulp stone. Ultrasound will break them up, but in other instances you can remove a pulp stone intact. Notice how big this stone is from its occlusal to gingival dimensions. I cut a little hole through this pulp stone and shredded some floss in there, and even today, right now, I'm wearing it just under my shirt. This is quite a find for me. But listen, joking aside, stones block canals, and clinicians sometimes can't find canals because they don't have the technology aboard to play above the rim. Now, we use ultrasonics for a variety of things, and in this particular instance, the same case, we would always want to emphasize running out the interconnector between the MB and the ML. Notice as we run out the interconnector, on occasion there's a mid-mesial. And if you cut right to the post-op, you can see this mid-mesial needed to be shaped a little bit more conservative than the MB and the ML. Why? Because there's a furcal side concavity. So the shape is a little bit more conservative. And notice this particular mid-mesial has its own apical portal of exit. Notice the importance of straight line access.